I think I want to ask you, if you want to get into the Word of God, say I. Aye. All right. Well, I know this is going to break your heart, but being that it's Thanksgiving, I'm going to take a one-week vacation from Revelation. If you came just to hear about the end times and when he's coming back, uh, you're going to have to wait till next Sunday for me to unlock all the mysteries of Jesus' exact return date, and the Antichrist's name spelled backwards, and all those things that you come to church to discover. Uh, but I do want to give you a message on Thanksgiving. Amen. And you guys should know this about me. Don't get too attached to holiday-themed sermons, because I break the rules sometimes, and sometimes I just preach what I feel like God wants me to preach. And regardless of the holidays, but I've become really fond of Thanksgiving. Like I like, don't get me wrong, I like a lot of the holidays. I, I love July 4th this year. I went up to North County. Oh my gosh. I will never not go to North County again for the July 4th parade. So patriotic and festive. Oh man. Um, man, the other parts of this county need to get on board with North County for celebrating July 4th. I saw more flags than I knew what to do with. This is really cool. Uh, I like I like Christmas. I like Easter. I like Thanksgiving. And you know what? I like the theme of Thanksgiving. I, of course, I like the food. Everyone likes pumpkin pie. I prefer pumpkin cheesecake. But I like the theme of Thanksgiving. And the more I read the Bible, the more convinced I am that that didn't start with the pilgrims or the Native Americans. I think it started with God. I think Thanksgiving is originally his idea. And I think we can celebrate, you know, some of the historical origins of Thanksgiving. But I think more importantly, we should celebrate our origins, who we came from, where we came from, and the generous father that we have in heaven. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So that's what I want to talk about today is Thanksgiving. And, you know, the thing that's been going through my mind is this little phrase. This little phrase, I don't know if it's God whispering it in my head or maybe I've been hearing you guys say it lately, but here's, here's my sermon this year. It's thanking God in advance. Hmm. Thanking God in advance. That's our message today. Yeah. If you like to take notes, that's, that's your title. And um, yeah, it's just been in my head and I like a lot of things in advance. I'm going to think about this. How many of you guys, you like some things in advance? Does anyone like some things in advance? i got to be honest. There's some things I like in advance. Um... Thinking about this, we were eating dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, and this happened just a few days ago. And uh, I was with my family, so some of you know some of my family members, so don't hold this story against them. But uh, we all served our plates and sat around the table. And I typically like to go towards the end, you know, I don't like to rush to the front. I'm not that starving, but uh, I kind of wait. So I come down, sit down, probably last or second to last. And, and everyone's already eating. We already prayed. And everyone looks over at me and my plate. Have you guys ever had a moment where everyone looks at your plate and then comments about what's on your plate? Do you guys enjoy those moments? It's even better if your mouth is full and you're chewing. And so anyways, one of my siblings, blood siblings, looks over at my plate, whose name I won't mention. Uh, she looks over at my plate. She says, Josh, why aren't you starting with salad? Why don't you start with veggies? She says in front of all the kids, probably as a little bit of a shame-based lecture to teach children. And I finished my mouth full of Traeger cooked, smoked turkey by my brother-in-law who cooked it himself. And I wait till my mouth is completely done chewing a delicious piece of smoked turkey. And I say, because my salad is not going to get cold. That's right. Yeah. See, there's some things I like in advance, and there's some things I don't like in advance. I don't need my salad in advance. My salad's not going anywhere. And don't get me wrong, I went back for salad, but not until I had two servings of Traeger cooked turkey and ham. And I, I even consider potatoes in the meat family when served with meat. I don't consider them a veggie when they're smothered in cheese and cooked to golden perfection. Okay, so there's some things I like in advance, and vegetables is not one of them. I just don't know why people think you need to eat the salad first. Sorry, moms. Sorry, kids. I like my meat in advance. All right. So uh, there are some things I like in advance. I like information in advance. Does anyone like yeah. information? I like prior notice. Man, I, I'll tell you what. My employees who give me advance notice when they're going out of town, I'd be sure to thank them with as many smiley face emojis to reinforce how... Nice that is of them. Two weeks notice before you go on vacation. Thank you so much. 
24 hours notice? <clears throat> Thank you for at least 24 hours notice. You know what I wish? I wish I got prior advance notice when they're gonna get sick. That'd be really nice. Hey, I'm gonna be sick three weeks from now, and I'm gonna take my full 12 CDC recommended days off from work, or whatever it is. I would love that. I'd put it in like green ink on my calendar, or green font. I would just really enjoy some things in advance, advance notice. I wouldn't mind it if people had to tell you when they're in a bad mood in advance. Like, no offense, none of you I know ever have a bad mood. Uh, but some people, like the person next to you, sometimes they have a bad day and a bad mood and a bad attitude. I wouldn't mind if you got heads up, advance notice. I'm just saying I might reschedule some meetings or conversations or phone calls. Now you all are looking really like, oh boy, is he talking about me? No, I'm not talking about you. Of course not. The person next to you is more suited for this moment. But don't you guys kind of agree that the world would just be easier if we got everything in advance? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Some things. Um, and I'm just, I always have to tell you when I make a joke like that, I'm just joking. You're allowed to have a bad day, and you know what I like about bad moods is you get the truth out of people. I prefer your bad mood sometimes because I actually get the truth, so just keep that in mind. All right, let me tell you something else um, about advance that I'm not always sure if things are advanced. I've been seeing billboards for paycheck in advance. Anyone ever seen those? I don't see them a lot in this like city and county, but I drive through other cities and all of a sudden it's all about get your paycheck in advance. Uh, and my like history in the cult of Dave Ramsey tells me there's something fishy about that. And uh, maybe they give you your paycheck in advance, but I think they also give you interest yeah. in advance. And they also give you a bad habit of always needing your paycheck in advance. So I'm just not sure about some of these things. I don't know about billboards sometimes. We don't have a lot of billboards around here. I'm just reflecting on some things look appealing in advance, but I'm not always sure if they're better for us. There's one thing I'm becoming overwhelmingly convinced of that is good for us, and that is uh, thanking God in advance. Amen. I realized I just kind of took my opening and flipped it backwards. <laughs> Because I was talking about things that we receive in advance. And now I'm saying thanking God in advance is good. And that's not even something we receive at all. Thanksgiving is something we give. It's something we give back. Something we give to him. We just did a double backflip if we're talking about thanking God in advance. Because I usually thank God looking back. I thank him for what I see in hindsight. That's a double backflip to thank God in advance. It's not about receiving and it's not about what I received in the past. It's about looking forward to something I may not have received yet at all. Thanking God in advance. And I don't know, I'm, I like things quickly too. I like things immediately. I have a microwave and I like to use it. Some people use the stove to reheat stuff and we tried that for a couple years and we bragged our friends about how healthy we were, no microwaves in our house, but we went back to microwaves. I like microwaves. I like instantaneous stuff. I like having my app to buy stuff, and I always want to know if it's free shipping, but more importantly, is it two-day shipping? I like stuff quick, I like it now, and I just think that's kind of the way this culture is conditioning us, to want things and to want it now. It's not always sure if that's what's best for us, because God's kingdom is often backwards. Um, I was thinking about this verse, it's a curious one, because the Bible says Jesus said it, but the Bible doesn't show us ever hearing Jesus say it. So Jesus must have said it to someone, and then they wrote it down. Uh, it was Paul, and Paul never met Jesus in the flesh. But Paul received teachings from the disciples, the apostles who did walk with Jesus. I wonder how many messages from Jesus are like that. But Paul tells us one of them, and he said this, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul said those are the words of Jesus. Must have been a favorite teaching of Peter's or James or one of those guys that didn't pen it. In the gospel accounts, Matthew or Mark or John, uh, but it was said nonetheless by Jesus and written in the scriptures by Paul. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And I, I'm not, I'm not against receiving. I think it takes humility to receive. How many of you guys have ever learned that? Sometimes receiving takes some humility. Sometimes receiving from other people is a little challenging. Sometimes receiving from people that maybe we don't want to receive from is extra challenging. Uh, receiving takes humility. Uh, but the Bible tells us it's even better to, to give, even more blessed 
There's more happiness in store in giving even than in receiving. Man, this backwards kingdom, it's not just about what we get. It's about giving. I'll tell you a couple more things about uh, thankfulness. And don't worry, we're going to get into the Word and read a story here in a moment. I want to remind you of a couple things Thanksgiving is not uh, as we're looking into this concept of thanking God in advance. Thanksgiving is not predominantly an emotion, a feeling, or a personality. Like I like to think I'm a thankful person, and sometimes I tell people that. We say, how are you doing? I say, thankful. I think I learned that from my, my parents. We say that sometimes, and sometimes we really mean it. Sometimes we say it because we want to mean it. Uh, but thanks, thankfulness is not just a personality, predominantly not a feeling or emotion. It's an action. In the Bible, it is primarily an action. So there's a scripture many of you are familiar with. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Philippians 4, 6. And the word, the Greek word for thanksgiving there is Eucharistia. It's in the Bible 15 times. It's translated as thanksgiving nine times, giving of thanks three times, thanks two times, and thankfulness as this like feeling or emotion only one time. Only one time. So it's like God didn't want you to think that thanksgiving is not also an emotion. That's just not his emphasis in the Christian life. It's maybe 10% or something like that. But it's predominantly an action, a verb, something we do. It's a, a discipline when necessary. It's a, a lifestyle. It's a, something we're sowing into. And yeah, there's a byproduct. There's a harvest too, which is thankful feelings, thankful emotions, and maybe even a thankful personality, but it doesn't start that way, and that's not how God measures it. Something else I want to tell you about Thanksgiving before we jump in the story is it's not always just looking backwards. Now, don't get me wrong. I think we all have something to look back on and thank God for. How many of you guys agree with me? We have plenty if we really look back. And I, I know there's things that we look back that maybe are harder to thank God for, but there are certainly things that are much easier to thank God for as we look back. But like I told you, we're doing the double backflip. God's standard for Thanksgiving is not just looking back. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation with Thanksgiving, Present your request to God. So that means there are situations we're facing that require forward-facing thanksgiving. Forward-looking thanksgiving. There's probably a situation in your life right now that requires not just thanksgiving in hindsight, but thanksgiving in foresight. Looking forward. Looking towards what's in advance. Thanksgiving in advance. Well, there's a famous story in the Bible. Some of you know it. It's about Jehoshaphat, and it's in 2 Chronicles. It's in the Old Testament, and it's a curious story. I like it. I, lots of times I uh, refer to this story when we're talking about the topic of worship and how worshipers go first in battle. Worship goes before uh, the solution, before the breakthrough in battle. It's a neat story. We're going to read it, and I'm going to stop and go some and just kind of show you how this man, Jehoshaphat, was, uh, should I say, he was forced to thank God in advance. He didn't have the answers. He didn't have the solution. He didn't have the battle plan. He certainly didn't have the victory yet. But God did. And he thanked God in advance. We're going to look at his story, and we're going to turn this back uh, to ourselves. So let's go ahead and read this. If you want to read with me, we're in Second Chronicles 20. It goes like this. You can just listen. If you don't have your Bible, I'm going to read it out loud. It says, Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Munites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. And real quick, you might wonder, what is this whole came about after this? Well, Jehoshaphat had, a, he had a, an upstream. It means he had a past. I wonder how many of you, you have a past, and sometimes your past finds itself a flashing uh, parts of your past to you as you're processing the present or the uncertain future. Um, Jehoshaphat almost lost his life. Uh, here he is a young king, and it's not his first time in battle. He's almost been killed before. And here he is, we're about to find out, 
headed towards another war. How many of you guys have ever had to face a war that you've already faced before and it's not so happy? There's some associated, maybe trauma, maybe PTSD, maybe feelings of uh, anxiety just come up. Maybe you lose your breath just because you go, oh boy, I've faced this before. Oh boy, I've been to this doctor before. Oh boy, I've seen, I've heard those words from my boss before. Oh boy, we've had this argument in our marriage before. Oh boy, I've seen my kids go down this path before. Certain things cause us sometimes to have that uh, temptation to get anxious, temptation to uh, look back at things maybe we're not supposed to look back at. Anyways, that's what this verse one is telling us. Jehoshaphat had some after this in his life. Verse two, then some came and reported Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude's coming against you from beyond the sea. Out of Aram and behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that's in Gedi. Verse three says, Jehoshaphat was afraid. I think we should stop there and just see that uh, Jehoshaphat, though a king and though he's gonna be a hero in this story, the Bible tells us plain and simple, he was afraid. Some of your versions says he feared. He was anxious. This was probably not just a, a little fearful uh, moment. This probably was an intense, fearful moment for this man. He's made bad decisions that got him into bad places before. He's been in situations that he can't blame anyone other than himself for in the past. And here he is again, tough situation. And the Bible tells us he was afraid. I'd just like to give you license to know that uh, fear is, fear, though the Bible tells us not to be afraid and not to fear, there's something about it that we have license to experience and there's something about it that God doesn't give us license to perpetuate. Fear is an emotion, fear is a temptation, but as we like to sing, fear doesn't have to be my future. Fear doesn't have to be uh, my lifestyle. Fear is not my God. Fear is not my portion. Um, and here, Amen. he's afraid, but God's trying to show us that it's not who Jehoshaphat is. It's not his identity. The Bible doesn't tell us it's his diagnosis. It doesn't tell us it was his mental condition. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on those things. I'm not saying that anxiety and fear aren't absolutely related to our mental health and can be helped by doctors and counselors and medication. I'm not against all that. I'm just saying the Bible sometimes cuts straight to the heart, goes for the jugular. It's not politically correct, and that's what we're reading today, God's Word. So Jehoshaphat was afraid, but the Bible tells us immediately what he did. He turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Now, this is one sentence, and I really wonder how long this sentence actually lasted in his life. I wonder if it was a day, I wonder if it was 30 minutes, because sometimes when I'm afraid, it takes me longer than uh, two seconds to all of a sudden seek the Lord and go into fasting and go into that courageous place with the Lord. I don't know about you, I'm, I might be the only human in this room, but I am curious if there was a little more to this story, what it looked like between he was afraid and he turned his attention to seek the Lord. And I wonder for you how much time there is between you're afraid and you turn to seek the Lord. I don't know, let's keep reading. So he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you and are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands so that no one can stand against you. Just stop for a moment. This is just making Jehoshaphat look like a hero. But he was an afraid man just a moment ago. He's seeking the Lord, he's fasting, and now he's exhorting the people of Judah, reminding them about the God that they serve, about God's faithfulness, about his character and his nature. Now he's going to remind them, he's going to speak to, let me read verse 7. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you. For your name is in this house and cry to you in our distress and you will hear and deliver us. 
Now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you've given us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is a really, um, really impressive moment for this man, Jehoshaphat. I don't know if you guys can see this, but he's, in, on one hand, looking like a very courageous and brave leader. He's standing before the people of Judah, commanding them to take heart and to remember God's faithfulness, how he's protected them, how he's made covenant with them in the past. Um, and yet he's saying, I don't really know what to do. He says, we're powerless. He said, I don't have the battle plan. I don't have the solution yet. I don't have all the answers, but I am knowing one thing. We're going to look ahead to God who's giving us this victory in advance. We're going to thank him in advance. We're looking forward to him. Our eyes are on you. And I hope someone's getting encouraged right now in your situation to look to God and to look forward to what he's going to do in advance. I hope you're getting excited. Let's read a little more. Verse 13. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph. And he said, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. I wonder how many of you need to remember that today, that your battle doesn't belong to you. If you belong to God, it's his. Verse 16, tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Let's read some more. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and of the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. Man, can you guys see how courage is contagious? And courage doesn't always look strong and proud. Sometimes it looks kind of desperate and shaky, but it looks like willingness to trust God. That's what Jehoshaphat has here. He has this trust, and it's this willingness to trust. It's not a strong-looking faith. But when he gets before the people, it comes out in this form of contagious courage. And everyone here is following his lead in seeking God, turning away from the temptation to fear, and willing to fight this battle as God leads them in faith. It's going to be marvelous. Let's read some more. Verse 20. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he had consulted with the people, here's what he did. He appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. As they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. I'll stop there for a moment just so I can explain what's happening in case you never heard this story. So in Old Testament times, uh, the people of God trusted in the God of the Bible and God's presence was with this people and marked them to, by protecting them, by speaking uh, to their leaders, to their prophets, and also his presence was in their temple. So at this point in Bible history, Jesus yet had not yet come to the cross. He had died for our sins. He had risen from the grave and poured out his Holy Spirit to come live inside of believers. That hadn't happened yet. So the people of God here are seeking the presence of God by listening to their leaders and their prophets um, 
Today, as Christians, that's still a part of our life. We still believe that God appoints authority and prophets and apostles and leaders and gifted people who hear the Lord. But we also seek the Lord to speak directly to each of us. And I would say that to you. If you uh, haven't become a Christian yet, God wants a relationship with you straight from him to you. You don't have to go through a priest anymore or a church. Uh, you get to go straight through God, uh, through the mediator, Jesus Christ. He's the great high priest. And then he sends himself to live inside of you. His name is the Holy Spirit. And you get to commune with God daily. You get to bring all your fears to God daily. You get to bring all your feelings and emotions to God, your requests, your desires to God daily. You get to thank him daily, and he fills you with his courage. Well, here we're seeing an Old Testament prototype of that as the people of God are trusting in the voice of God. They're not filled with the Holy Spirit indwelling them yet, but they absolutely are seeking the God of the Bible, the same God that you and I have gathered to worship today in the name of Jesus. So uh, the story, um, breaking it down, um, these there are specific people in uh, Judah's in Judah who are uh, the priestly worshipers. And that's why it says these people who were appointed to sing. You're like, doesn't everyone sing? Yeah, but there were people who were specifically set aside to lead worship in this priestly duty of singing. It talks about their holy attire, their clothing. And they are picked in this battle to put be put ahead of the soldiers, the warriors. Uh, you'd think they'd pick the, the mightiest, strongest warriors out in front of the battle with the weapons and the shields and the spears, maybe the archers. It's not what they're doing. They put the singers out front. You might say, well, that seems like a suicide mission. Why would you put the weak little choir boys out in the front? They're just, they're high little voices. They're not going to scare anyone. Because um, God had a whole other thing in mind that was coming for them. So verse 23, that's what happens. Um, 20, 22, rather. When they began singing and praising, here's what happens. The Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had, when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Man, so what just happened? Uh, before Judah even gets to meet them in the battle line, uh, God confused these armies and they destroyed one another. God sovereignly went before them as they were just singing and worshiping. And God won this battle for them. Let's read a little bit more. It gets better. Verse 24. When Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude. And behold, they were corpses lying on the ground and no one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things, which they took for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because there was so much. I think I got to stop there for today. But that's significant, too, that God wants us to see they didn't just win their battle. God gave them their investment with interest. They didn't just defeat the bad guys that wanted to kill them. They took all their plunder. They came out not just even and not dead. They came out ahead. They came out extra prosperous. It took them three days to gather all the spoil, all the plunder. I don't know why I've been thinking about this whole concept so much lately of thanking God in advance. Um, I think something that happened to me uh, maybe like a little less than a year ago is um, I, I have a business and my uh, best seasoned veteran employees said, hey, Josh, uh, we need to tell you something. We're going to move across the country. And uh, I'm talking like I've got really good employees. Like I know employers always complain about their employees. I brag about my employees. I get great employees and do really good work. And uh, and one of them was with me 10 years. Very, very good guy. Loyal. Did a lot of good stuff. Um, many came and said, hey, we're moving across the country, but we're giving you six months notice back to notice. That was great. Wow. Uh, that's not how I took it. I, my initial reaction inside my head was I felt my, lose my, I lost my breath for a moment because I've depended so heavily on good employees to help me. Uh, I'm not a one-man show in any area of my life. I very much uh, rely on people who help me. Amen. And so I, I had a nervous moment in my heart. And I, I, maybe I should have seen it coming, but I didn't see it coming that soon. And I lost my breath. And, you know, I probably said some 
you know, classic textbook employer thing. Well, congratulations. It sounds like this will be a great adventure for you. You've served really well in this company. But that's, it wasn't my heart speaking. It was just my mouth and my, my rhetoric of textbook employer responses. And we finished our meeting and I walked out and I walked to my car and my car was parked, you know, down the block. And I just had a moment to seek the Lord and kind of decide what I was going to do. And I'm a, I don't know about you, I, I'm an obsessive problem solver sometimes, but it didn't feel like a moment where I needed to be making a strategy. It seemed like a moment where I needed to do a Jehoshaphat and seek the Lord and kind of find my courage. And so I remember walking to my car and thinking, like, what do I do? Do I call my business mentors right now? Do I, you know, go Google what to do in this situation? And uh, I just had this moment of saying, I think this is a defining moment for me to, like, thank God in advance. I don't want to be in this situation. I, I don't expect everyone to understand how this was really made me nervous. Maybe you've had a similar situation, but this was my trial. And I was, this hit me in a very vulnerable place. I remember just saying, God, I'm going to thank you in advance. I do not know how I'm going to get out of this hole. I do not know how I'm going to uh, find my way to where I've achieved or where we've grown and be able to be even on par with where we are. I don't have a strategy. I don't know if I can do this, but I know you do, and I know you. And so I'm just going to do the only thing I know how to do right now. I'm going to thank you in advance. Just going to trust you in advance. I'm going to just worship you. I remember just turning my music on and just starting to sing and worship and do the thing. You know, if I don't have breath, uh, I just, I can start worshiping. I can take a deep breath and pump out some off pitch notes and sing praises to God and just in worship, remind myself who he is and remind myself that he fights my battles and he's gone before me and he has an answer in every situation I'm in. And he cares about me. He cares about my nervous, fearful, frail moments. He cares about when I'm intimidated. He cares about when I'm lost and, you know, thinking worst case scenario, thinking more like an orphan than a child of the most high God. He's there for me. I just remember thanking God in advance. And, you know, I should probably tell you that God, God's faithful and he always is. You guys probably can know this is going in a good direction. I already filled all the positions raised up leaders, and uh, God God helped me, and I'm better than we were before. And that says a lot, because we're in a great place. So that's God's faithfulness, and that's over the last uh, six to nine months. Very thankful. Um, and I try not to wear my emotions on my sleeve, but I've had to have, some, I've had some nervous moments throughout this thing. I, there was some space probably ongoing between me having fearful moments and remembering to seek the Lord and seek Him deeply. Um, but I can, I can testify that uh, he's the God who deserves thanksgiving in advance. And sometimes that's the only strategy we need in certain seasons of life. I think there's probably things that life will pitch at you that you can't, you can't win those battles with human reasoning, with human skill, human thinking. You can't do it with your best mentors. You can't do it with your best Christian friends. You can only do it by going to Jesus and going to him in your frailest, uh, weakest moments and thanking him in advance, and maybe staying in a place of thanking him in advance, of advanced forward-thinking thankfulness, until he fills your heart with courage. Um, yeah, he, he is worthy of giving thanks. I just personally am so thankful that he's met me in this way. I felt like I should tell you a personal example, not to make myself the hero, but just so you know, I'm trying to practice uh, what's preached in here too. I'm not perfect, I'm in the same boat as you, uh, but I experienced the faithful God of this Bible. And I want to testify, he's, he's real, he's true to his word. Amen. And I wanted to give you a few tips as we're concluding. Five things that happen when we thank God in advance. Because I want you to thank God in advance. I want you to do it as soon as you get out of this room today. But whatever situations are heavy on your heart, maybe you're in a season where you're on the mountaintop and God's been faithful. You know, I want you to Make a covenant to the Lord. I want you to resolutely tell him this is what you're going to do when you're faced with challenges is that you're going to thank him in advance. There's five things that happen. One is when we thank God in advance, it helps us to look at God. Very simple, but it helps us to look at God. Because sometimes our situation is really tempting to stare at. And sometimes we're unrighteously gawking at our situation. We're looking at it too much. 
And it's unrighteous to look at our situation too much. I would even say it's a bit immoral. God is a jealous God, and he doesn't want you looking at any other lover. And sometimes our situation, we are unrighteously, immorally looking at rather than looking at God. He's a jealous lover. He wants our hearts. It's not that he doesn't care about our situation. He does. He deeply does more than we can because he cares about you. But when we uh, give more of our attention to the situation than we do to him, I would say it's spiritual immorality. I would say it's spiritual adultery. And God doesn't need us to over fascinate, over fixate, over uh, overemphasize our situation. He wants us to turn our focus to his character and his nature. That's what happens when we thank God in advance is we look at him and we see how faithful he is, how good he is, how strong he is, how capable he is, how wise he is, how caring and concerned he is, how benevolent he is, how involved he is. Second thing that happens when we thank God in advance is we are personally changed by God. So first, it helps us to look at God. Second, it helps us to be changed by God. I think um, this is one of my tips personally, because I'm not uh, the perfect example for thanking God in advance, but I think the thing that helps me to do it is remembering that God is not just uh, excited for the outcome, but he's excited for my growth and my transformation. I know that in every season and every situation, God has treasures for me, not just in the form of blessings, but in the form of growth and maturity. And I choose to get excited about that. And sometimes it's the only thing I can get excited about. My situation I told you about recently, I, I knew that would be very stretching for me. And, it, and honestly, if you told me two years ago that would happen, and, I, and you asked me, Josh, do you want this situation, even though it's going to grow you? Or do you not want the situation? I might have been tempted to say, I prefer not to have the situation. I'll, I'll leave that growth for someone else. I like the way things are going. But in hindsight, I know better. I know better now. God wants to change us when we thank him in advance. We all know the scripture, or many of us rather know the scripture, Romans 8, 28, that tells me God works for the good of those who love him, those who have been called according to his purpose. There's more to that scripture. Verse 29 says, For those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So what's that saying? It's fancy words saying that God doesn't just know the good plans he has for our lives. He knows the great change that he wants to accomplish in our character. He knows the maturity he wants to add. He knows the perseverance he wants to add, the, the hope, the faith, the strength the perspective, the empathy, the humility. Those are all things we don't get if we just always get the blessings in advance. Sometimes we get those things when we thank him in advance. God changes us. Number three, when we thank God in advance, it helps us to be with God. So my first one was helps us look at God. Number two is be changed by God. Number three is it helps us to just be with God because God doesn't just want to have a transactional relationship. He wants to have an intimate relationship. He doesn't just want you to have a transactional approach to our Father in Heaven. He wants to have a relational approach. I don't mind if my kids come to me and ask me if they can have this for Christmas. You know, they've already made their Christmas requests. I don't mind. That's okay. But if that's all we ever talk about, I'm going to get a little annoyed. I'm going to get a little frustrated. And I might start thinking about Scrapping Christmas this year. We wait until next year to teach them a lesson. Uh, but you know, if they just ask me here and there, and then they say, Dad, I'm so excited for Christmas. I'm excited for that present. And they thank me in advance. It kind of keeps me happy. I don't know what I'm saying. It's, I'm not comparing myself to God right now, but I'm just saying, if you were in God's shoes, would you want to always be approached in a transactional way? I'm not saying... You need to forget about your situation and your desires. I'm just saying sometimes you do need to forget about it for a moment and just be with God. The Psalms tell us that uh, he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And that presence, that table rather, is intimacy. It's him. He is the greatest treasure. He's the greatest feast. And just want to remind you, even in your darkest times, God's there. And he might be more appetizing in your dark times than you realize 
Thanking God in advance also helps us to wait on God, helps us to be patient, helps us to remember that God's timing is better than ours. If we could just microwave everything in life, I don't think it would be as good as we anticipate. If we could microwave every situation, every relationship, every conflict, every longing, every dream, every heartbreak, if we could just microwave it right out of existence, I don't think we realize how much we would miss out on what God has. And then lastly, thanking God in advance helps us to fight with God. Now, I didn't say fight against God. I don't recommend that. But fighting with God is part of the Christian life. And God wants us to have an active participation in many of the things we pray for and we long for. And it's not that we should get ahead of God, but it's that when we're in step with him and we're in rhythm with him and we're thanking him in advance, we're letting him change us in the meantime and create character and put our focus on him, not the thing, uh, then God fills us with courage and perspective and wisdom so that we can take the right approach when it comes time to fight. So that when you're in that situation, you execute well. And God says, look at you, you're the hero, even though he fought the battle. But you're, you're part of it. We fight with God. I'm going to ask you to stand. Man, I love giving Thanksgiving messages. It's probably my favorite message last year was Thanksgiving. I love reminding you and myself to give God thanks. And this year I get the privilege of reminding us to thank God in advance. So I just want to give you a moment to do that right now. It's a quiet moment. You get to thank God in advance. There's something in your life. There's someone in your life. There's something in your future unknown and uncertain. You don't have all the answers. You don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but God does. The Bible says we get to thank him. That we're not to be anxious. But we're to pray being thankful. Sometimes that's by thanking God in advance. So God, right now we get this moment to thank you in advance. I thank you right now, God, that we're in your, your gym and you're building our spiritual muscles. And uh, I, I don't think any of us go looking for pain, but when you are allowing pain, we pray that it will come with strength on the other side. That it will be pain followed by gains. It will be pain followed with resilience. It will be pain followed with perspective. God, none of us want to relive the painful parts of our past. None of us want to dig up old traumas. But we can't always control what we are dealt in the present. And Father, I pray in this moment that every heart would be filled with a resolution to thank God you in advance to not wait to thank you to not wait till it's all clear to not wait till it's all resolved but to thank you ahead of time but i thank you that this is stronger than any kind of witchcraft this is better than new age manifesting that we have a real loving father who is intimately involved in our life and sees everything <coughs> we think and everything we struggle with I thank you that we have a loving Father who is readily available, who is closer than we can ever imagine. God, I thank you right now for the reminder in every heart to thank you in advance when we're in a fearful moment. I thank you that's not superstition. It's not religious. It's not just a script. It's faith. It's choosing to acknowledge who you are and the way you work before we see the outcome. And I thank you in advance, in Jesus' name.